across the USA. Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost inviting you to join me right now for the next half hour of Outdoor Digest. We have an array of activities. First of all, we're gonna start off in northern Quebec, the Ungava country. Beautiful country where we begin a three-part series on caribou hunting with bow and arrow. This is gonna be part one, I think you're going to enjoy it. Then we're gonna drop down to our northern United States to look at European fishing techniques through the ice. And finally, tip up town USA, the granddaddy of all ice fishing carnivals, coming your way right now, so stay tuned. It's time for the Outdoor Digest. Ungava Bay is the famed caribou country in northern Quebec. Sometimes thousands cross rivers and lakes in massive herds during the fall migrations. The bulls are in velvet. They hardly notice the cold water rolling off their muscular backs as nature drives them to more favorable wintering grounds. We booked this hunt through Safari Nordique flying from Montreal to Fort Chimo in the Ungava Range, then taking an otter 150 miles west to a remote camp. Although some of the country had small trees, most of it is quite barren. Tundra, land of caribou, ptarmigan, arctic fox, wolves, and Inuit Indians. And our hunting camp. The otter reverses the pitch on its prop so it can stop on the short makeshift landing strips on the tundra. There are no roads up here, and we're going to be on our own for a week. Three tents make up our hunting camp, one for the guides and two for the hunters. This is luxury considering the location. Bow hunter Phil Grable from Lansing is in our party. Dave Borgeson, the assistant DNR fisheries chief, is also an avid bow hunter. Each morning, we'd leave in boats to be dropped off to our hunting spots. And this, the first day, was the sunniest but the sun never shows itself for very long. Dave Borgeson Jr. rounded out the party and the four of us, along with cameraman John Ford, set out the first week in September to fill our caribou tags with bows and arrows. The country is definitely far different than the northern United States. It's wide open and quiet, but intriguing. Small clumps of trees dotted the landscape here and there, but that's not where the caribou hide. There's really no place to hide in the tundra. It's quiet walking because of the spongy lichen that covers the rocky earth in northern Quebec. The caribou eat the lichen, and a few wandering bears eat the blueberries, and we found lots of them. And we probably would have spent more time picking and eating, but they were quite small. Needless to say, no blueberries made it back to camp. I tossed them right down the hatch. That's about it for the flora of the tundra. I suppose there's lots more than meets the eye, but there's not much we recognized. Compared to deer hunting, well, when you see a caribou track, there's no question about the size of these animals. They're big, and they leave big tracks. Seeing caribou is commonplace, and for deer hunters, oh, I tell you, it's exciting. Both sexes wear antlers, and the smallest headgear you see would be a prize on any one of our white-tailed bucks. We saw caribou constantly, and oftentimes nearby, but always on far ridges. Unlike white-tailed deer that head for the woods, caribou have to protect themselves from wolf packs, and they seem more confident in herds in the open where they can see a long distance too. I've never been to Africa, but from the pictures I've seen, it looked remarkably like the wild herds on the African plains. Like blueberry picking, we spend a short time fishing, casting spinners in the fast current by the rapids. If the fish were on the feed, we'd catch small Atlantic salmon. Dave Borgerson Jr. brings one to shore. They're beautiful fish. Dave Sr. prepared some poached in water. Oh, you can't believe the taste, and you can't believe the fight, either. Oh! I 
okay. That's why they jump like that. To throw the hook. Boy, they're incredible. Incredible. Right at the falls where we were fishing, a cow caribou and her calf plunged into the current, made a dash for the other shore. They're vulnerable in the water, but that's not how they're hunted, at least by man. Wolves keep an eye on the caribou crossings, though. We saw wolf tracks in the sand on the shores. They wait for caribou to cross, and if they get a chance, they'll take the calf. All this sunshine came on the first day, followed the next day by rain all day. <laughs> We became well acquainted with Bert and John and Gordy from New England, rifle hunters who would undoubtedly get bigger trophies than us bow hunters, but we had a great time together. Wood is hard to come by in the tundra. It gave us precious warmth. Yeah, we had electricity as long as they kept flying in the gasoline. After dinner, we'd swap a few stories, then hit the hay, because the days were long. Don't be fooled by the sun peeking through at daybreak. Ten minutes later, it can be raining, then the sun, then more rain. An hour's boat ride, and our guide, Al, drops John and I off by the same rapids we caught fish the day earlier. No fishing today, though. It's time to hunt caribou, an animal whose population has been growing in northern Quebec. It's excellent on the table. In fact, of all the venison I've had, I rank caribou at the top. I had this thought in mind the whole time I was hunting. With a bow, I wasn't counting on getting a trophy. I just wanted to get some good meat. My clothing, by the way, is made from Gore-Tex, the best rain repellent wear I could find in Gore-Tex mittens. The temperature was close to freezing mornings and evenings. We spotted caribou as soon as we crawled up the riverbank. Two cows and a calf, a good sign the caribou were moving. In the next few days, I'd have moments of excitement. You'll see some of these next week. And the most exciting moment I've ever had while hunting, you'll see on this show two weeks from now. John Ford was right behind me with his camera. The record book bull was 40 yards ahead. My heart was pounding. Yours will, too. Don't miss it. This one's coming this way. <laughs> This was our caribou hunt from 1988 up in Ungava country in Quebec. I mean, gorgeous country, and we're just getting started. Two more weeks of this, and by the way, in our current Outdoor Digest magazine, you notice on the cover is a caribou. This is an Alaskan caribou. We have an article in here called Big Caribou about a technique of stalking a large caribou that I use in two weeks on Outdoor Digest. So now let's switch gears a little bit. You know what this is? If you're from the north, you might recognize it. No, it's not a strainer for food. It's for scooping ice out of the holes when you're ice fishing, the subject of this feature right now. It's ice fishing time. Your only chance to walk on the water as an angler to fish anywhere in the lake. Open water can be dangerous, but if you know the currents, you can find some good fishing near this open water where the ice is safe. The day after a cold front, Bob Garner and our European fishing specialist, Craig Scoff from Hazlitt, suited up in their wool hunting outfits and headed for a new lake. I can tell you how this turned out right now. Nearly a bust on this day. Our Michigan Outdoors experience has taught us that the day after a storm hits, ice fishing shuts down. But Craig explains why this spot looks so good. This is open water, That's and right. we, we are close. That's right, real close. We're maybe a matter of um, 10, maybe 15 yards here. Uh, we got about 10 inches of ice and about 16 foot of water. And with this inlet here, it's warm water coming in. And what that means is food for the fish. That warm water is gonna breed plankton, and the minnows are gonna be there feeding on the plankton. So that can mean crappie, bluegill, whatever, right here. Well, a panfish right here. Yeah, probably, plus, you know, if you want to put up some tip-ups, you get a good pike. Because like I said, there's going to be a lot of schools of minnows here. Looks like a good place to fish. Oh, excellent, yeah. <laughs> I think I think we'll probably do real well here, hopefully. <laughs> well, in fact, you got a couple, we've got a couple of holes already drilled over here. 
The next day or so, this pair fished several lakes to finish the story, but this did look good. In fact, what's the, uh, okay, you got the depth finder going right now. Yeah, what, what we got going right here, they're showing two spots. The second spot down from the bottom is actually what they call a second echo. And what that is, that means it's a good reading because it's flashing up twice. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's giving you a second echo. And that means we're getting real good depth reading here, the point where if anything did come in here, even plankton, a school of plankton come in here, you'd read it for sure. So hopefully, you know, we'll get some fish coming in the screen here. Well, we've got the fish food. We might as well get the fish, right? <laughs> That's right. Now, we're using the, the, what's called uh, the Euro larva. Mm -hmm. uh, they're Maggies or what are some of the other names you have? Maggots. <laughs> maggots, <laughs> yeah, maggots. you call them Maggies or whatever. But anyway, uh, uh, will, this, will this technique work just as well with a waxworm? Uh, yes, it will. Uh, there's no doubt about that. It'll work good with a minnow even. The thing I like about the maggots is that they're tough. They got a real tough skin. Generally, you could catch up to 20 fish just on one. Uh -huh. So that makes it a lot nicer. I don't like going through, you know, 50, 50 uh, waxworms in a day. I'd rather go through maybe one or two larvae in a day. You can you can go through and a whole day ice fishing. Let me let me understand this. With one or two larvae. Yeah. And catch fish. Oh yeah, easily. Okay. Us usually, um, you've hooked them a little bit wrong. The ones that you lose are the ones you've hooked wrong. You've bu you've bursted them. But if you hook them to that little lip of skin, you won't have any problem. You use extremely small jig hooks or uh, a little ice hooks too. Uh -huh. Extremely small. Like what size? Uh, probably, yeah, 16s, 18s, even smaller than that, depending on what's going on. And the amazing thing about this method too is, is I don't recall seeing you catch a fish where that they ever swallow the hook. No, they don't, because the float is so sensitive. It doesn't doesn't allow them to to take it very long. And that make, makes all the difference. Yeah. That float just makes a little dimple and you're hitting it, right? Yeah, just barely moves. I could shot this even, even a little bit better. Put another small shot Perfect. on and I could, this guy, see they're not dedicating themselves today. Dedicating? They're not dedicating themselves. They're not coming right in and grabbing it. You gotta be patient. Some fish, it's funny because some fish today have been taking it real quick and some have been kind of playing around with it. Okay, there you go. <laughs> a little bit better one. Yeah, not much. They're getting a little bit better. It's not too bad. A little bit later, I'm going to put on a slip float with a minnow and see what we can do with that with, for the specs. Let's see how she's sitting. Ooh. All right, there we're getting. We're getting hits already. Craig, when the big ones move in, they generally are going to hit lighter, right? Yeah, that's correct, and that's why I'm, you know, fishing the float. Now, uh, why, why it, it just doesn't seem to make any sense that the big ones hit lighter than the small ones do. Why is it that the big ones only seem to barely mouth a bait when the small ones move right in and snatch it up? Well, you, you said it right there, you know, the smaller ones are in larger schools with smaller fish, and they're, they're eager to get it, you know. They can't wait around and you know, find out whether they want it or another one will come in and grab it. So it's almost c because of competition, they're competitive. Yeah, that's right. The larger well, bluegill, they're not too worried about that. They've been fed over the years and they're not worried about where their next meal's coming from, right? They're, you know, they don't have any competition around. Those, a smaller bluegill generally won't just come running, running in up against a big bluegill and grab it. Now, I've seen you before be able to catch larger bluegills because uh, the the larger bluegills wouldn't even move, wouldn't even move these spring type bother, bobbers. Yeah. But you could just barely see a dimple, just a dimple in the uh, with with the floats that you use. That's and right. You'd, you'd set the hook immediately. That's right. Well, it depends. Uh, you've got to mess around with a few fish to find out exactly when you hook set the hook. Sometimes you've got to give it a while. Sometimes they come in, they take it real quick. You just it's gonna t it takes a few fish to really find out what's going on. Got one here. Whoa! All right, there he goes. Whoa! Oh, oh double phone, header. Yeah, double header. Oh yeah, nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not big. Ah, got it. That one felt like it must have turned sideways just right, right through the lip every time. Craig Scoff caught three times the fish that Bob caught using the conventional ice fishing method. These lightweight peacock quill floats are one reason more sensitive than cork bobbers. Number 14 hooks and Euro larva 
What a combination. No comparison with the American spring bobber and number 10 hook. European fishing techniques seem like they'd catch small fish, and they do, but more than their share. And Craig catches plenty of big ones, usually more than anyone else who's fishing around him. Try European fishing methods. It can turn a slow day of ice fishing into an action-packed adventure. That's called a European-style fishing technique, and it's basically the type of ice fishing technique we use in the north that they use in Europe. Those tiny hooks, those tiny little maggies, they catch fish in the summer that you won't believe. I know you think that you have to use big baits and big hooks to catch big fish, but it isn't true. We'll show you in the future some of our summer expeditions with that. Now, let's head towards Tip Up Town, USA for a different type of ice fishing. Sunrise over Houghton Lake, the first weekend of the 39th annual Tip Up Town Festival, and there's plenty of ice. Holy mackerel. I mean, that's down to, down to my elbow. Yeah. A good 16 inches of ice here on East Bay, and from his wheelchair, Roger McCarvel manned the ice auger. But this is where the walleye are. He knows what he's talking about. Yes. Roger's from the Outdoors Forever program, proving that handicappers can enjoy ice fishing, and Kathy Beitler is bundled up, her back to the wind and to the sunrise. Got the sunrise on one side, the moon, moon on the other, and the walleye yeah. right below. Well, Roger was right on two counts, the sun and the moon, but the walleye didn't seem to be down there today. Maybe they were intimidated by the full moon, but the weather change didn't help, and local angler Bob Barney had brought us to his favorite spot. This particular spot that you're fishing in right here, this is East Bay on Houghton Lake, and it's deeper than most of the rest of the lake. Yeah, there's, to the middle of the bay, it goes from 16 to 20 foot. Mm -hmm. And how we're fishing about 10. 10 right now. Yeah. But you say we're on a little island or something or a well, ridge? Yeah, a ridge. And just on the other side of us, we got 16 foot on both sides of us where it drops. Now, you tell me you don't fish this, this part of the lake in the summer. <laughs> no. I just, I tried it, but I just don't have good luck. So I fish mostly the North Shore. Huh. Well, of course, you grew up over there. Yeah, right? I'm more familiar with the area. Mm hmm. Now, you use a jigging Rapala. Right. With no minnow or anything on it. Nothing on it, just bare. Hmm. Don't a lot of the fellas use minnows out here? Some of them will use the heads on the treble mm -hmm. hook, on the bottom hook, but I just use it plain. While jigging is very productive, setting tip-ups with live bait is the technique Houghton Lake is famous for. Here's a homemade tip-up that a fellow named Chet Flazer developed about 10 years ago. Counterbalanced by a sinker, the rod balances on a post that's dug into the ice, and instead of a flag popping, the rod tilts when a fish takes one of the baits. A sinker on the bottom holds the line tight, a tip-up technique that's becoming more popular. Here's the most common type of tip-up with a submerged spool of line, but on Saturday morning, we didn't see one fish taken on a tip-up. The cold front, oh, I tell you, that even kept Bob Barney down to one sublegal walleye, far below his average through this hole in East Bay. The fishing didn't make headlines on the opening day of Tip Up Town, but you might have heard about some cars and trucks going through the ice. Ours didn't, because we didn't drive over the big pressure crack that stretched along the south shore of the lake. The driver of this suburban tried to straddle the crack, joining over 30 vehicles who reportedly tasted the water under this weak spot. Was the ice unsafe at Tip-Up Town? Heck no. Take a look at the crowds and all the ATVs and snowmobiles that were supported by what was probably close to a foot and a half of ice at the Tip-Up Town site. Everybody crossed the pressure crack except the cars. Well, I can prove to you that there was plenty of ice for everyone's safety. Let's take the sightseeing tour that's a popular attraction at Tip-Up Town, a chopper ride over the lake. Cars were on both sides of the pressure crack, and recreational vehicles, and lots of people. Why don't they walk to their fishing spots? Well, look at the size of Houghton Lake. It's the state's largest inland lake, 22,000 acres, five miles from one side to the other, and just about all of it is laced with weed beds. It's shallow, averaging seven or eight feet deep. It freezes over quickly, the ice is extremely thick, and you can catch fish just about any place. 
but not on this Saturday morning. Oh, have we got a big one? Oh, she got a big one. Whoa! Look at that. <laughs> How many is that today? Oh, half a dozen. All that size? Well, they caught a few larger ones, but not much larger and not many. Everybody asked me where the fish were biting. They doing anything down the East Bay? No, that's where we were this morning, and it's uh, this weather keeps changing every other day. Yeah, it's fronts moving through again, and, but no, we haven't. No pike at all, not a thing. It's pretty, pretty slow. Yeah, it's a slow day, but families still enjoyed the sunshine and open air. But to duck those bitter gusts of wind, people set up makeshift ice shanties of all kinds. A lot of people using regular summer camping tents. With a kerosene or gas heater, a temporary shelter makes a nice little ice fishing getaway. Some people didn't even set up a tent. A tarp between two vehicles provides a tip-up camp for big groups. And how do women and kids like Tip Up Town? How do you like it? I love it. This is great. This is a party. You come up every year? Uh, last year we came up and we came up again. So, yeah, we'd like to make it every year. We just got a place up here, so. Oh, super. Yeah, it's fun. We had nibbles in our little shanty, but they got away, you know, the little ones. Barbara Gates from Warren is bound to become a Houghton Lake regular like the rest of us. Even if the wind was blowing, the fish weren't biting, and there wasn't as much snow as the snowmobilers would like, there's more than enough ice on Houghton Lake. Our midweek rains in southern Michigan will have little effect on this ice. William was welcoming us a recipe for too much gun soup. Mm -hmm. And it was a winner in our cooking contest. Look, he calls for snowshoe hair in there, but it, really any type of small game. Right. Now, he said you, if you didn't have a large rabbit, you could use a rabbit and a squirrel or two squirrels, whatever. Pheasant, grouse, right. even odds and ends mm -hmm. of small Anything game. Anything would go work in this. this. And the rabbit pieces here were pre roasted. And then we're just going to mm. put them in here so that we can get the meat to fall off the bones much easier. Couldn't you just just boil them off sure the bone? Could. I mean, sure you don't have to pre-roast it, No, uh-uh, nope, but this one was, so that's why we're going to use it. And there it is, all off the bones. Off the bone, bone with no shot in it. No shot. you can pick off at this time. Right. And we're going to add some herbs here. We're going to add a little bit of oregano and thyme. This recipe is a real good, hearty recipe. It's got a lot of vegetables, and in fact, it mm. almost looks like a vegetable soup recipe. And some thyme, and just this is, as, as I recall, this is about the end of the spices. That is, exactly, yep. Now and then you start adding your vegetables. Yeah. And he says, um, and I have to agree, not to come into small pieces, to leave them in quite large chunks. you got fresh tomatoes and potatoes. Hmm. And like I say, they do cook down, so you want to leave them quite large. So th this means you're going to cook it for a while. Right, exactly. Sort of and like carrots. It's a very colorful recipe. And egg noodles, everything all goes into one pot. It's a super recipe like this. I recall this recipe doesn't have... A, a lot of moisture to it. No, nope. like I say, it's real hearty. And corn, hmm. and corn, then broccoli. Broccoli. Sounds like you could just add all types of odds and ends, Anything not only you a wanted. game. Yep. I bet you Garner can hardly find fault with this one. This has got everything in it I like in a recipe. Noodles, plenty of vegetables. <laughs> Noodles. <laughs> lots, of, lots of good meat. This is a very tasty, just, just put it in the category of good food. I really like it. And you know what I got? You know what I got here, Bob? What? Oh, too much gun. Piece of shot. Too much gun. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, well, aptly named. But this is good. This is an all-around uh, hearty vegetable soup, for sure. Everything in it. It's not mm -hmm. the, the other thing, too, is a lot, a lot of times the soups are really liquidy. I like these. I like these that aren't, where you can really get into the mm -hmm. substance of it. Not only is this recipe delicious, it's easy to prepare like all our recipes. Well, I hope you learned something from this edition of Outdoor Digest. Of course, a lot of this material is right here in the magazine. Things about caribou. Remember, this is a three-part series. We're going to be heading into part two next week. But the ice fishing techniques we use. Don't sit back there and say, hey, I live in the South or I live in some part of the United States where we don't have ice fishing. Try those ice fishing techniques wherever you are in the summer. Totally amaze you. And whatever you do, try to get outdoors this weekend if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. the temperature was close to freezing mornings and evenings. We spotted caribou as soon as we crawled up the riverbank. Two cows and a calf, a good sign the caribou were moving. 
In the next few days, I'd have moments of excitement. You'll see some of these next week. And the most exciting moment I've ever had while hunting, you'll see on this show two weeks from now. John Ford was right behind me with his camera. The record book bull was 40 yards ahead. My heart was pounding. Yours will too. Don't miss it.